Woodstock was the first time there had ever been a national concert event. It was the first mega concert. They were expecting like a fraction of the people that ended up coming. Did you hear? It's free, man. Concert's free. When Woodstock happened, they created in the course of a weekend one of the biggest cities in America. It was somewhat chaotic, but it was indeed three days of piece of music. You know, half a million kids here, and nearly a million try to get in here. Just the idea of Woodstock make people want to come. The idea that people can live together of all different stripes, colors, and the variations would be beautiful rather than a cause for prejudice. It was such a joyous event. That's what made it so special. What's amazing about Woodstock is that you saw the power of all of those people congregating. It was the movement that actually put an end to the war. That was a pretty powerful thing when you keep pushing and pushing and pushing and the numbers keep growing and growing and growing. You can actually alter history. You get the sense of the impact of these thousands and then tens of thousands of people swarming into this little upstate area and blasting their consciousness with there's a different way to be. It was only three days and the consequences of it are still echoing through time. I think it's just fascinates people. How was the concert? It was great. It was great. The story of Woodstock and how it happened is impossible to tell as a movie. It's too big, it's too haphazard, it's too crazy. But to tell a tiny little piece of that story from a little corner of unexpected joy that helped make this incredible event take place, that's a good end for our story. So, here we are. Right, uh, yes, as I mentioned on the phone. You have a permit. Yes. That's very cool, Lally. It's a very strange, almost like fate brought us to this project. I was doing um, a promotion for my last picture, Last Culture in San Francisco. It was Six o'clock in the morning, I was in the local TV station, and Elliot Typer, the writer of this book, was right behind me. I got off, and he was about to wind down. He gave me a one-minute pitch. <laughs> it's the worst possible story a producer could tell, because every year about 200,000 books are published, and I just don't want to encourage 200,000 people to chase after Aang down the street and think he's going to take the book. But he took the book, he started reading it, he shared it with me, he said, what do you think? And there you have it. Basically, you have the baby boomer that's coming of age. So that is the Woodstock we take into heart. The irony, of course, of our story is that wow. our hero never gets there. There's just so much stuff going on, he can never get down that road. But you thought you were just gonna drive right up to it, huh? And yet, his life, his experiences define exactly what it meant. Governor just declared this whole county a disaster area. Yeah, it's a disaster. I'm the disaster guy this film. It's how it changed one person's life. And I think that's that's the only way you can tell that story. It's through somebody's eyes who experienced it in one way or another. I think I'll head over and check it all out. On foot? It'll take you all afternoon with this crowd. Here. In a lot of ways, I think Elliot is just kind of along for the ride. But it's an interesting ride because he gets to kind of interact with all these different people. And then me as Dimitri, kind of similarly, I get to do a scene with this actor, or that actress, and this actor. Hold my mouth. So it's like a weird tour of like acting and, you know, people. And then objects and animals and extras who are also people. What will your people here in White Lake think of 100,000 hippies and what they will do to the town? Native White Lakeians cannot be considered people. I never work with a comedian <laughs> to carry a movie. It just never happened. It's presented a challenge that I very much welcome. In both his demeanor and his look, his disposition, let me put it that way, is very close to the character James and I were created. He just fit. I have the usual? Geez, sorry, Elliot, I think we're out of the usual. Plus, he's funny, he's genuinely. <laughs> out of the usual? Wow, that's unusual. There are great characters in this story. And, you know, there's nothing better than for an actor than get hold of a good character. No! Those two that didn't do nothing in there, shake them, put them back. But, Ma. Electricity, detergent, who's paying for all that? At the start of the film, Stupid boy! Elliot's parents present a kind of unified block of just complete Jewish dysfunction. Dad, that's bleach for laundry. It kills the germs. That's a difference. But as the summer progresses, and especially as Woodstock takes over, his father really comes back to life in front of his eyes. Yeah. Yeah. When Jake makes such an instantaneous connection to Vilma, it's a way for Elliot's father to say, I can love you too, can't you tell? 
you should go to Nexus. Go see this thing. He finds the means, in a small way, just in a few words, to, to say to his son, move on with your life, you know? That's really good parenting. See you soon. Vilma is an example of someone who lives with tremendous contradictions and complexity as a character. Elliot eventually begins to see the truth in that. You do need some real security around here. And you're a real security? I like the idea that Vilma kind of looks like somebody who might be a little lost or doesn't have it together, but then ends up being one of the people in the movie who seems the most self-possessed and self-aware. So in that sense, there's an interesting little parable there in First Impressions. You were in Korea. Semper Fi, little prick. Sergeant, U.S. Marine Corps. If Vilma can live with those contradictions and be such a generous person, then why can't he? Does my dad know, you know, what you are? I know what I am. That does make it easier for everyone else, doesn't it? It's marvelous. Leo Schreiber looking just so sweet and beautiful. It's a great big girl. Heavenly. How can I help you, Miss? Very von Vilma, but you can call me Vilma. I've always been a big supporter of Elliot here in Bethel, and I always enjoy his music festival every summer. That's why we're here. It was important to get the vibe of Michael as opposed to being sort of just like him. Obviously, I'm in the vest that he wore, I have the hair that he has. They wanted uh, spiritually and physically, I think, to sort of represent Woodstock. John and Joel and Max, they're all gonna come together. I can feel it. I think he just have the Mike Lane aura. Good vibes. He's angelic and he's a great seducer. He's also a businessman. I wouldn't describe $75,000 as cool. It's your bread, guys. I'm just trying to put you together here with Max's vision. He has to put all these pieces together. He's constantly working. It wasn't like he was just out there partying and having a good time while it was happening. It must have been incredibly exhausting, and even more exhausting because he had to maintain this incredible aura of kind of beautiful, hippie, it's all gonna happen. And it did, he was right. Mike Lang was absolutely right. It's all just like you said, Mike, isn't it? Hmm. Pick it up. Yeah. Three days of peace and music. I met him. In the park, he was playing one of the leaves in here, and I thought he was great in the part, and so we hung out a bit afterwards, and he's just such a really nice, sweet guy, and, and had the right kind of temperament, and, you know, I'm not an arm waver, and he sort of has that same demeanor. All of the stuff that people talk about, the way that he is, his, like, magnetic quality that he has, and his easygoing nature, and... You can feel that just the minute you talk to him. He's a really special person, and, and it was such an honor to play him, but also get to really spend time with him and hang out with him. We came to the first day of shooting, and he was in character, and he was wearing my vest, and I'm watching him in the field with Max, talking about renting his fields, and it was literally like an out-of-body experience. Well, you say you want to use the mic here. Because he had my body language down, and I was listening to the dialogue, and he sort of had that really soft way of talking, which I do a lot. That sounds fine. And it was just amazing to watch. It was just, it was weird and fascinating. It's fate. It's beautiful. Michael's entrance in the helicopter. That day on set was like one of the most incredible days of my life. The challenge of it was Michael Lang is like this very cool, very chill guy. And Aang was like, you gotta like really make sure you take in what's happening, but you sort of have seen everything before. It's special and it's nice, and it's a great way to be welcomed, but you can't react to it the way that I know that you sort of want to react to it, which is like, people are naked. You, cover your pots! That was a crazy day. It's just like, what the hell am I? Who am I? I'm in a helicopter, landing in a sea of naked people. It's ridiculous. Far out. I've always been a fan of Eugene. I think he's a, a really funny man. He played Walter Kornbluth, this dentist in Splash, who was kind of like the antagonist. It was so funny. What do you think of the mess we're making? And then his Max. It's uh, wonderful, isn't it? Such a different role than what people are used to seeing him do, and he just seems pretty great. I'm just sorry everyone in town hates our guts now. Yours more than mine, if that's even possible. Sorry. Oh, hell, these kids are fantastic. The only footage available for Max Yasger is the speech he gave at the Woodstock Festival, where he started off saying, I'm a farmer. His farm was a very successful farm. He was like the richest guy in Bethel, New York. And that's kind of how he approached the whole Woodstock deal. It was a business venture for him. And he grew to love 
what it turned into. I've heard more pleases and thank yous in the past three days than I've heard in a lifetime from those schmucks. He was a shrewd guy, but he was more than fair, I thought. The negotiation was quick. We did it in the field. Action! And it was based on what he had in the ground, what he was going to lose, what he wanted to make per acre, and a little bit extra. He was our hero. I mean, what can I say? I mean, he was our savior. He was the leading businessman in town, and the whole town basically turned against him, and he refused to buckle under, and he committed to us and believed in what we were doing, and he's, you know, stood tall through the whole thing. When you make a deal with me, it's a deal. Okay, so long as you promise to put things back in order, I'll stand by you 100%. A lot of Woodstock is like the new generation separating from the old generations, and that was the excitement of the time, was this whole new generation that was coming, talking about love, talking about acceptance. So when someone from the old generation, like Max, understands and connects with that generation, that's a really cool thing. I saw Bob charge a dollar to fill a bottle with water for one of these kids. A dollar? Yeah, can you believe it? A dollar. For water. Gee. <laughs> it's fun to see Aang enjoying the work. We made a deal at the beginning of the shoot that said the one thing we need to keep in mind on this movie is if it's going to work, we have to embrace the ethos of Woodstock even as we make the movie. And I really feel he's done that. Action, you guys. He's able to spin 25 plates at the same time. <laughs> okay. Cut, cut, cut. He can look at the rhythm of the shot, the color, the pacing, the timing, the text, the pressure within the scene, what you did on one line, whether your breath was too late, the, the timing in between, the reaction, the look. He's onto everything. <laughs> I don't know where it's going to go. Like, yeah, it's it might land on you, it might go. Like, no, and towards some area so he can all duck. He's very meticulous, but it's because he has such a clear idea, you know, of, of what he wants. So he doesn't quit until it's perfect. Stan and your theater guy set up some medical volunteers. It's an interesting challenge to be pushed as an actor past where you think you're capable of going. And your mom gave me these blankets. My mom? Gave? Yeah, she's cool. Aang was just as interested as I was in all the little details of the scene, and we had so much fun figuring all those little details out. And Dimitri's new to the game, so he didn't have experience as an actor. So with me and Aang around him, we just took him right to the ground, really got his feet wet, threw him in the pool practically. So he was really having a great time too. When we started to think about making this into a movie, we get our hands on everything we can. Of course, the movie, the album, anything from 65 to 69. Historically, newspaper, fashion, music. We have a very good researcher, David Silver, very soulful, his, whole, his, his passion about the 60s that really bring a lot of knowledge into my, my head. They wanted to create vignettes for background uh, so that the extras weren't just some sort of mass. Right, and read this. But there were very specific little storylines that Dimitri and other actors could pass them and it was really authentic and it felt like that time, rather than just being sort of a version of it or a, a caricature of it. He wanted specifics. Action! It's really important that the people making the movie know what they're reproducing. And if the background people um, know why they're there and what they're doing, it helps the people in the foreground do their part. Excuse me, what is a chicken off soap? Not yet, soap! I think the casting did a great job, extra casting. They came all over, and they're very genuine and love of local people, too. They're just wonderful people who want to be in a movie. They're genuine. They don't look like extras. And in this part of the world, in the, in the Northeast, particularly in Vermont, New Hampshire, Massachusetts, Maine, there are many groups. They're not actually hippies, but they are the evolution of those hippies, and some of them do embody some of the ideals that the hippies believed in. They would show up, they were wonderful, they were lovely. It was great. They would play ultimate frisbee games, they'd start drum circles, they'd write songs together, they'd work out dance routines. It was fantastic. And it was exactly what Ang wanted, just that family feel for especially our main set in front of the motel. Ang Lee had a wonderful idea for the Elmonica Hotel. He created seven tribes. There was the Willow Tribe, the Biker Tribe, and that helped us understand um, what was happening at the motel. If you go by the motel today, God, it looks like uh, 400 homeless people live there. Background artist, action, and elegant. Now I had a war room. I put all I need on the, on the research and spread them out and distribute it in different scenes. I made a graphic plan 
on the huge wall. We made this board. It's a schematic of the movie, and all these little post-its are all the bits of ideas that Ang thought were important to have in the movie, and this is where they play. And every column is a scene, and then these blue stripes make story days. So it kind of starts slowly. You can see all these light yellow ones are, are bits that were in the script already. All these other different colored things are things we added. There's no room in the, in the motel parking. That part's in the script already. There's a couple kissing against a tree that they just never, it's like this never ending kiss. It's a kiss that just goes on and on and on. And we have all kinds of different spiritual stuff kind of floats through the movie. And, and one of the things this chart was really good for is we were afraid that maybe we would get all the religious stuff like in this sec section of the movie and nothing on the side. So, you know, with these post-its we could go, oh, Hare Krishna here, Swami here, Georgette here. No, no, Georgette here. <laughs> hey, Georgette. You know, and we, and we could spread it out in a way that it kind of felt, you know, the right measure that uh, Aang wanted to have. I don't think anybody do that. <laughs> But you know, when there's a need, uh, you, you, you create. I really like the Earthlife players. In the uh, documentary, they did this kind of performance where they all have daisies and they pull off daisies and say, he loves me, he loves me not. And we wanted to find a place for that. He loves me. I love you. <laughs> Working for Ang Lee, his scrutiny of the background is bar none compared to any other director. It's wonderful to work for someone who cares so much. You feel like your job is worth it. Film sees everything, and if everybody behind the camera is looking at their watch, it ruins the shot. You're happy and going to festival, you know? Tired, but some smiles. Think of me. It's amazing how important staging the events behind the actors uh, becomes. Thanks for sticking it out. Thank you. The hair, makeup, and wardrobe department does such a wonderful job with the background. So they look the look, they walk the walk. They are 1969 concert goers. So I'll get them on set and I'll set up the vignettes. And we'll start seeing the shot and thinking of what we can do to fill in those iconic still photo images, the person with the bed spread over their head as it's raining, someone wrapped in an American flag. I believe the photo has six people in it, but we did it with four, who are all standing with a piece of cardboard over their head to keep the rain off, but they're completely soaked. So you have these historical references, but, but your shot is enormous, so you can, you can kind of hide them in there and reveal them when they're most effective, rather than hitting you over the head with, hey, you remember this photo? Here it is again. What do you think of the kids here? I think it's great. Yeah. Uh, I got one here myself, and I got uh, one in Vietnam. Wow. wow. And I wish he was here in the mud. The core of the film is that the music and the peace and the love was like the magic medicine for all these different people in the film. Come on, man, I love this fucking hell. That kind of energy, that kind of love, that kind of goodness makes everybody's life better and makes the world a better place to live in. There's no big golden pot at the end of the rainbow in this script, in my view. But what there is, is people can almost, in, in their different ways, they can see a purpose to move forwards positively. Put all my stuff in my car. That's a sign. I think the goal of the film is that by going back to Woodstock, we're gonna, we really hope to let you open up something new and fresh. If your car moves, come look me up. I'm going to San Francisco. I think that we're making this movie just in time. It's important to, you know, remind people and commemorate this festival and, and what it signified. The legacy of Woodstock is love, music, and how we live with our environment and other fellow race and countries and cultures. We have to keep it alive. Beautiful. Beautiful. Peace.